Uh, we're going to talk about being born of God, but first I want to show you kind of an anchor point for us as we move through the, the Bible. First Peter, first Peter, he's over there before second Peter. First Peter's towards the back of the New Testament, the end of the, the, end of the whole Bible, you'll find Peter. If you don't know where Peter is, uh, that's okay, you'll learn eventually. My first Bible, I made sure I got the little tabs that had the little names. And uh, these days, people don't even need that. They just get their electronic device. I bet, all the new, I, bet, I bet all the youngsters don't even know where it. If you gave them a paper Bible, they'd be lost as a goose. <laughs> first Peter chapter 1 here. Uh, verse, we'll start with somewhere around here. Over there. Verse 22, 1 Peter 1, 22 says this. It says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. You got that? Do y'all have fervent love toward one another? Or are we going to have to beat it into you? Come on, you got to really love each other with a pure heart, fervently. Love each other fervently. I mean, you got to really love with hot love the Christians. Right, right. I mean, really, you got to just, I mean, this scripture could change your whole life. This scripture could help you never be mad at another Christian as long as you live. Yeah. This scripture could help you not ever be mad at any church ever in your whole life. Love each other with a pure heart fervently. I'm not hearing a whole lot of, you know, excitement. Or, if I was preaching something like, God will bless you, yay! But when we say something like, do something, oh! Love each other with a pure heart. I mean, you got to really love me. you got to really love the person next to you. you got to really love across the aisle. you got to look at people and think, oh, man, how can I bless you today? It's time for y'all to start bringing money to church to give to somebody. Amen. Just bring an extra something. You know, hopefully a, a Benjamin. <laughs> I'm going to give this to somebody. The first one that makes my heart flutter <laughs> with the love of God. Right. Right. I'm not talking about chasing a spouse. I'm talking about <laughs> the love of God here. Verse 23 is what I wanted to get to. Having been born again. Remember Jesus said you must be born again. Right. You must be born again or nothing matters. You must be born again or you'll never see God. You won't be in the kingdom of God. You'll experience nothing of God. You can believe in God without being born again. You can look at the skies and the mountains and think there's a God. But you cannot experience God unless you're born again. Amen. I said you cannot experience God unless you're born again. Yeah. You must be born again, Jesus said, or you will never see him. It says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So you being born again is by the word of God. So when you think of God, you must be thinking of his word. When you think, oh, how much I love God, you must be thinking how much I love his word. Because the Bible says that Jesus is the word. He was the person of God in the beginning with God. And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So you must, you must tie the word to Jesus and to the spirit and to God. It's the same. We were born again by Jesus Christ, yes. By the Spirit, we were born by the Spirit, yes. And it says here we were born by the Word of God. And it's not corruptible. It lives and abides forever. And that's why we have to study it. And that's why we have to like the Bible. And that's why you have to be interested in the Bible. And that's why you have to want to know some scripture. And that's why you want to understand the Bible. That's why you want to spend some time on it. And that's why Christians ought to be passing scriptures around. How about passing truths around? That's why we do it. Because it's forever and it's, and it's alive. So I would, I would hope that we could entice you to get addicted to the Bible. Addicted to the Word of God. 
Because there's nothing else like it. Because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. You stick with the word, you will endure forever. So that's our anchor point. Now go to 2 Peter, since we're close. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, verse, verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who've obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. God has given us all things through the knowledge of Him. So you have access to every heavenly thing that you need for life and godliness through the knowledge. All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who call us, to glory, who call us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Where are those promises given? Right in here. Right, right between these two uh, pieces of leather here. Right on that little cell phone you got going. You better be looking at the Bible. <laughs> the precious promises are there. Through those are the promises. That through these you might be partakers of the divine nature. So through knowing the Bible, you can partake of the divine nature. You like become like God. Not in ruling the world, even though we do rule the world one day. But I'm talking about in the essence and nature of God. We, we have the same nature as God. Hallelujah. But you'll never know it without the Bible. Right. You'll never partake of it. You'll never understand it. It'll never do anything to your life until you take the promises. Until you learn the Bible, until you accept it as yours, until you identify with yourself in the Bible. I mean, you got to find yourself in here. you got to know yourself through the Bible. You can't just know yourself in the flesh. You can't know yourself with or without makeup. You can't just know yourself by what you're seeing in the mirror. You can't just know yourself by your history. You can't just know yourself by what other people have said. You have to know yourself through the Bible. You'll be a happy creature. You'll be a happy creature if you'll, if you'll just let the Bible tell you how you are. God loves me. He knows me. He cares for me. He, he thinks I'm all right. And he's given me the promises so that I can get right. He's given me the promises so that I can be like him, so that I can partake of his divine nature. All right, so the Bible's necessary. I think that's, we said all that to say that the Bible's necessary. Go to John chapter 1. But you know, hey, look, we all kind of know that, but how much do we neglect the Word? How much do we neglect this aspect? You know, sometimes it's like, well, I got saved and I know God, and so I'll just live my life and do what I think, think is necessary. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll live based on my opinions. I'll live based on what I feel. I'll, I'll live based on what I want to do. Thank God I'm saved. Uh, but really, that's not how we're supposed to do it. If you're going to be a happy Christian who is never unhappy by circumstances, the Word of God will have to be necessary. So let's talk about being born of God because if you're born of God, you're something new. If you're born of God, then you're way different than them. I don't know, nobody's really over there, but you're way different than other people that aren't born again. And so you have a new nature, a new identity. You have a new potential in your life if you're born of God. So, uh, John chapter 1, verse 11, it's talking about Jesus. He came to the Jews and they didn't receive him. But it says, he came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him. You know, they missed him. They, most of them did not believe he was the Messiah. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So if you receive Jesus, you have the right to become the child of God. 
Verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I mean, that sounds like religious speak, but you got you to gotta check it out here. You were born not because your parents decided to have a baby. You weren't born because two humans decided something. You weren't born because some plan of man. You were born by the plan of God. You and I were born of God. Nor of the will of man, but of God's will. You were born again by God's will. God wanted you. If you have received Jesus, then you were on the list ordained for eternal life. You got picked by God. Well, but what about what, you know, that seems kind of mean that he wouldn't pick, you know, my other friends. Listen, and then people get a little, un, uh, they misunderstand predestination and think, well, God's already planned who's going to be saved, so why do anything? No, what you have to understand is that God knew you before you were born and he knew your heart would be tender enough toward him. Hallelujah. And so he wrote, went ahead and wrote, wrote your name on the list. Yeah, I know she'll get saved because her heart will be right toward me. If you have received Jesus, he knew that you would have a tender heart toward him, that you would submit your will and bow before Jesus Christ. He knew you. He chose you. Jesus said, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you Amen. and ordained you that you should go bring forth fruit. Remember that? We are born of God because God decided. We're born again by God because he decided. Hallelujah. Look at John chapter 15. <clears throat> John chapter 15. Oh, I want to just read some of this because it's fun. Okay, verse 14. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So if you want to be a friend of Jesus, you're going to have to care about obeying. Right. You with me? Right. I mean, I know you may mess up every once in a while, but you've got to care. Right. You'll be called a friend of Jesus if, he said, if you obey me. Right. There's a whole bunch of believers in Jesus that aren't really friends of his. Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Did I, did I read Jesus scripture out loud? Oh, I'm sorry, very sorry about that. No longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Okay, let me, let me backtrack just for a second because there's probably some uncertain Christians around. Uh, in the New Testament, now Jesus is ministering under the law at this point. He's explaining how they should be obeying God, okay? Uh, over in the New Testament, it talks about the commands to obey. The commands to obey under the New Testament is to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another. Those are the commands he's referring to for us. You follow me? Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you do. So you got half of the obedience going. You can be called a friend of God. And then love one another. Okay? And this is, this is that kind of takes care of everything. I know that you may not pray as much as you ought to, and you might not be reading your Bible so much these days because your cell phone's so important. I know that there's all sorts of things that help, you know, kind of make you feel if you're wondering if you're doing right or not. But listen, you'll be a friend of Jesus if you believe on his name, and I know you do. And if you love one another. And that's why we harp on the love of God here. We harp and we hammer and we command and it's important and it's necessary and it's absolutely the, the, the most important thing is that you love one another. That you allow the love of God to take you over. That you allow the love of God to squish your selfishness, your self-centeredness, your inconsiderate nature, your unkindness, your, your judgmentalism, your, your bitterness. You, it, it, it's imperative. I mean, it's absolutely necessary for, for God's 
plan to work in you, for you to experience Jesus Christ, for you to experience God Himself, for you to experience this new birth, for you to experience being born of God and a new creature, you must love with God's love. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends, for all things I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Not one amen, not one praise the Lord, not one excitement. I know, I know, you're excited, you're just just not showing it. Mr. and Ms. Christian, listen, the world hate you. It will always hate you. Do not play to be favorites with the world. Get used to it. I said the world hates you. I didn't say it. Jesus said the world will hate you. Matter of fact, that was his plan to take you out of the world so it would hate you. It doesn't say you're supposed to hate the world. Just not be of the world. I mean, you got to love the world enough to save them. You have to love the world enough to get them to, to shine the light and let and be good to them. But you're not of the world, and it's not going to like you. You're con- you're going to be contrary to the world, not because you're a mean Christian. You're going to be contrary to the world because you're a righteous person. You're going to be con- you're, you're going to be contrary to the world because you you like to walk in the Word and because holiness matters to you and because Jesus Christ is in you. And when the world hates you, it's not really you. I mean, this is Christianity 101, that you're going to have to get familiar with people not liking you. Best friends and family not accepting you. They're mad that you go to church too much. They're not, they're not real happy that you, you know, want to quote scripture. They're not real happy that you're happy. There's all sorts of reasons how they want to persecute Jesus. But it's not, don't take it personally. Get over yourself. If the world hates you, you know that it, verse 18, you know that it hated me before it hated you. (laughs) So you ought to be real happy when it hates you because you're with Jesus. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Still, no praise the Lord or nothing. When are you going to get it? (laughs) Glory to God. Listen, this gives you purpose. Purpose that I'm to be different. I'm not supposed to look like the world, sound like the world, listen to the world. Especially get shoved around by the world. I don't care what they think. You cannot be a friend of the world. Anybody who's a friend of the world is an enmity with God. That's in the Bible. I mean, if Jimmy Fallon and Jimmy Kimball are pushing it, I ain't. If they're saying it, I'm not. If Hollywood's harping on it, you can bet your bippy, I'm not. Something's off when the world is pushing. If you don't know who those two Jimmies are, we applaud you. Look at John 17. This is a prayer. This is a a beautiful chapter here. Uh, This is before Jesus is going to heaven. he's, He's telling his disciples lots of stuff. And this is John's account. And he's the only one that records this specifically. But it's a prayer that Jesus prayed 
to God. So you get to hear Jesus' actual words to God. Throughout the scriptures, you see Jesus saying, I prayed to the Father, and he went out to pray in the morning, and he, he got up early to pray, and all this stuff about Jesus praying, but you never get to hear what he said. John 17 is him praying, and you get to see his prayer here. And there's a reason why he didn't do that. It's because if he'd have prayed all these things out loud and have it recorded, then you'd just try to mimic everything he said. We'd have a prayer book, just do this, and it'd turn into some ritual. What Jesus wants is for you to follow the Spirit like he did. So what he tried to do is show you how to build a discipled life like he did so that you can walk with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit can guide you in prayer. But anyway, we do get this one chapter of him praying. And there's a few other little prayers, he, some words he said to God, but this one in particular. Okay. So, verse 1, he spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And I'll skip some of this. Um, verse 6, he said, I've manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words that you've given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. That's interesting. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. I want you to know that you and I have an intercessor. We have a mediator. Jesus takes care of us particularly. And all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are. So Jesus is praying to God that God would be one with us like he's one with Jesus. Do you think God answers Jesus' prayer? Is he one with you? He is. Why did Jesus have to pray this? Because God's will has to be prayed out in the earth. For God to actually get it done in the earth, he needs a human to pray it, say it, act on it. You understand? It's important that Jesus came to this earth and did an earthly ministry, which included prayer and declaration and prophecy so that God could have the doorway to get to us. People think that it's all up to God. He'll just do whatever he wants. No, no, he uses people. He needs people. He, he needs a human being to open his mouth and say the right thing, pray the right thing. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except goofball, uh, the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Just as I'm not of the world. So everybody say it out loud. Say, I'm not of this world. Does that mean you're an alien? Yes, you are. You're an alien here. This is not your ultimate home. You are born from above. The world has hated them because they are not of this world just as I'm not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Christians say, well, just pray that, that I'll, I'll, the devil will never mess with me again. No, Jesus said, I didn't pray that you'd take them out of the world, but that you'd leave them here. Christians don't need to be praying to get raptured soon. If you do it right, you can pray, come quickly, but don't do it trying to escape. 
Jesus didn't want you to escape. He wanted to leave you in the world so you could change the world, help the world. <clears throat> Verse 16, that, uh, excuse me, they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you've sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they all may be sanctified by the truth. Uh, I'm not going to teach on this, but notice, notice that uh, sanctify would be to separate as holy for the use of God. You are separated as holy for the use of God by the truth. You understand? So the more truth you have, the more prepared you are, the holier you are, the more separated, consecrated you are for God to use. Verse 20, I do not pray for these alone. Now, this is interesting. Remember, Jesus didn't pray for the world. He prayed for these disciples. How many disciples? Eleven. The disciples minus the one, the son of perdition. Okay. He was praying for the disciples. And there's more than, more than them. But look what he says. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So this prayer was not just for the eleven it was for every other believer in Christ. Amen. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. And that they may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. Well, wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? It's a heart full. It's a life-changing passage full that we are one with the Father. I've always liked this part. It says, the glory which you gave me, I've given them. Did you know that you have the same glory Jesus had? People are like, oh my gosh, I don't want to take the glory. Well, he gave you the glory. We get to have the same glory. Not for ourselves, not for self-applause, but to show God. The glory is supposed to be on us. The goodness, the love, the purity, the sincerity, all those wonderful God attributes are supposed to be coming out of us. It's in there. It's in there somewhere. We just have to let it out. Praise the Lord. All right. So is everybody happy already? Yeah. Okay. We'll see you Sunday. I mean, the goal is to be happy in life, right? No, I'm just kidding. If that was the goal, we're done. We saw it. We did it. We're happy. Okay. So I'm getting, I'm getting us somewhere here. We're born of God and we're not of the world. All right. And so let's not give attention you have to manage your attention, you know. Right. In, the, in the book of Proverbs, I mean, this is Old Testament wise principle. Solomon said, my son, give attention to my words. Amen. Attend to my words. You got to be careful where your attention's going. If you're going to do the will of God and fulfill the will of God. All right, so go back to... Um, Go to John chapter 8. Romans 12, 2, of course, you know, says, Do not be conformed to this world. Remember that? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. Don't be, but don't be worldly. Get transformed by the renewing of your mind to God's word. Why? So that you can prove the good and acceptable and perfect. So that you can do God's will. So that you can show what God's will is in the earth. So you got to get your brain washed. Everybody needs a brainwashing. It's like, well, that church, they brainwash people. Yep, we do. We brainwash people. We brainwash, we're getting our minds renewed. We're mind washing. Everybody needs a mind washing. You'll be a happier person, but you'll be a godlier person. So our brainwashing is not for selfish motives. It, it's for God to get a vessel to use. 
Hallelujah. Um, okay, so John chapter 8, verse 20 something. Verse 22, uh, verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So he's talking to the Jews here that didn't believe in him. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I'm from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Notice he just, he just reiterated, I guess John 17 was where he reiterated it. Here's where he iterated it. He said, you're of the world, I'm not of the world. The unsaved people are of the world and we're not of the world. We're just different. We're just different. The way we think is different. The, our pursuits are different. Our purposes are different. Motives are different. Everything's just different. Before I was walking in the kingdom of God, my uh, goals were different. My goals were highly revolving around uh, achieving and money and pleasures. Uh, but then I got in the kingdom of God and all of a sudden, uh, and building self up, you know, and I got in the kingdom, it's like, whoa, I'm freed from all that. What a great feeling to be freed from achievements and money and plaudits and popularity right. and fun. And that's why we say around here all the time, uh, we're going to we're going to party Christian style. We can have fun Christian style that doesn't include alcohol and inebriation of any sort. Does include food. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you need the food to, to take up some time of your life, you know. But anyway, Christian fun is when we experience God together. Christian fun is when Christians share the love of God between each other, when we have a spark of something a little different. John chapter 18. John 18. This is when Jesus was getting arrested. And then Pilate, uh, verse 33, uh, excuse me, uh, Verse 33, John 18, 33, Then Pilate answered the praetorium again, call, uh, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered and said, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? <laughs> Jesus, man, he, he, he was fun. He was fun. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And that's why, you know, Peter chopped off the ear. That was the, the point. Jesus put the ear back on and said, look, put your sword up. My king, we're, we're not here to fight. We're not, we're not here to take over the world. We're not here to make all governments do exactly what we want. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, we'd fight. You follow me? You got you to gotta fit the revolutionary war somewhere in your theology or not. Let's not get addicted to the wrong thing. Let's make sure that we, we understand the purpose of Jesus Christ. If his kingdom was of this world, he'd fight. He's going to fight. He's going to come on a horse. We're going to come with him on horses. And we're going to, we're going to rule this world in, with, a rod of, with a rod of iron in righteousness. Amen. We will do away with all two-party systems. Amen. We will do away with three branches of government. Amen. Come on. We will do away with 12-man 12, uh, 12 juries. Yeah. We will do away with wrong judges. We will be the judges. We will sit on the seat and rule with Jesus and we will fix the garbage. Hallelujah. We will 
flip the switch for newscasts <laughs> off. Good news channel. One channel, good news channel. We will, we will censor every piece of media. See, that's really what Christians want right now. Amen. We really want theocracy right now. It's frustrating that we can't force our way and force righteousness and we can't stop evil and we can't make people see it right. We can't do it because Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. If it were, he'd fight. Amen. So it's a, it's a futile fight to think we're going to fix every government. We're going to fix it. We're going to wipe this slate clean, man. We're going to take this world over. One news channel. The good news channel. And you'll be able to trust the preachers on it. You have to understand that there, the, the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand year reign with Christ and us in this earth, ruling the earth. There will be unrighteous people here. There will be unsaved people, unborn again people in the earth that make it through the tribulation and that are born. And we will rule and it will be done well. You'll be excited. You'll be happy. Your faith will work every single time you need it to. You won't even have to hop a train or a plane. You'll just believe your way. Uh, you can go visit the Middle East as much as you want to then. <laughs> Am I meddling? No, I'm trying to help you understand the world is not your place right now. This, the kingdom is not of this world. Right now, our job is to go into that world and get those people out of that dark world and bring them into the kingdom of God. Amen. So that they can go back out, get another person out of that dark world, bring them into the kingdom of God. So when you go out into this world and when you live amongst the world, it's not so you can be frustrated and upset all the time at the world. It's so that you can be good and loving and kind and different and have that twinkle in your eye. So somebody says, what is wrong with you? Say, come to church, I'll show you. <laughs> what is wrong with you? The Holy Spirit, the what? Yeah, come, I'll show you. <laughs> that's not Chris, that's not, uh, th that's not Jesus. Right. This is a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal. Look at John chapter 10. Everybody say this. Say, we will fix it. In the millennial reign of Christ. John 10. We are going to fix it. Praise the Lord. The only hope for any country, and you know, Americans think that we're all special and everything, but really every country, every Christian and every, I mean, Christians in every country feel the same way. They're trying to help their nation. They're trying to fix their nation. They're hoping they get a godly person in their nation uh, in leadership, and they're all praying, and they're all doing the same stuff, and frustrated, and frustrated, and frustrated, and, and I'm trying to help the church for years now not to be frustrated, not to be frustrated, not to be frustrated. We do our can as citizens. We have a civic duty. We do as Christians. We have a civic duty. And we need to do as right as we can all the time. But whatever you do, don't, put your heart, don't let your heart get frustrated with the world or you won't be able to save them. If you let your heart get mad at the opposite party in this country, you will not care enough about them to save them. Amen, Pastor. Yes! There I amen to myself. We're going to do everything we can. And hey, look, hey, if, if you're going to put it on the table, I'm as, I'm as frustrated and upset as everybody else. But I cannot let that in my heart. I hate seeing unrighteousness. I hate when people don't get it right. I hate when people have the wrong opinion. Well, everybody's entitled to their opinion. But yours is wrong. I mean, if I got scripture on it, you're wrong. So I'm as frustrated as anybody, but you can't let that in you. Or you won't care enough to save a soul. Your whole existence will be how wrong that side is. 
really how wrong sinners might be. It's not just one. Do you know that there's two major parties in the nation and one of them is not completely holy? We've done a whole study on, I think it's uh, only 12. I can't remember the percentages. I better not say them. You think that one side is all Christian, one side is not so Christian, but that's not true at all. They're, both sides are in the world, and they're very ungodly. But this is an election year. So I'm going to spend some time later this summer maybe saying some more things. So let me pause the button right now. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> For now, I just want to make sure that we're born of God and that we're close to the Lord Jesus and we understand what this whole oneness is so that we're right people of God. All right, so John chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his, they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. Have y'all ever seen the, uh, the, the video, little clip video of the sheep shepherd? Um, you can probably just look it up. There's probably several of them I think I've seen. But the sheep shepherd uh, has this special relationship with his flock. And so I, I've seen a video where they, they let tourists come up and try to say the same stuff to the sheep to get them to come. So you see all these, in the video, you see all these sheep grazing in the field. And, and they have like three or four different trial uh, tests for, you know, a, a, a tourist comes up and, and says, yakety yak, 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 whatever the thing is. It, it's just a little saying that that particular shepherd, every shepherd's different. But a little saying, so they will, they will say the, the, the saying and try to get the sheep to come. And the sheep are just, I mean, they just got their tails turned to them. You know, it's like they're not even paying attention at all. Just stubborn as a sheep. And then the next one comes up, and, and they try it, and nothing. And the next one comes up, and they try it, and nothing. And the next one comes up, and they try it, and nothing. And the sheep just won't listen. And then the, the, the sheep, their own shepherd comes up, and he says the same thing with his voice. And all of a sudden, the sheep go. And he says it one more time, and they all come running. And it's very special. And, and you, you start recognizing we're supposed to be sheep. The only problem with that is that sheep aren't all that smart. It's not a great analogy that God used in calling us sheep. Or is it? <laughs> they're, supposed, they're pretty low. I hear they're pretty low on the totem pole of wisdom. Or sharpness. Like a pig is even higher. So uh, that's not all important to God. What is important is that you hear his voice. And the truth is, you know, out of all of our reasoning, we're not, we need to recognize it's not necessary sometimes. When we're following the Lord, our reasoning needs to go away. Like no sheep needs to be grazing and the shepherd calls and you're like, just a second. I had a plan over here. I was going to go over here and eat this over here. But Christians do it all the time. We try to take the reins of our own life and we make our own decisions when really the Lord wants to lead us. And if you're a good sheep, you'll hear his voice and you'll follow. And if you're a good sheep, you won't listen to the stranger. If you're a good sheep, you won't listen to the world. If you're a good sheep, you won't let the world shove you around. If you're a good sheep, you won't let the world scare you. If you're a good sheep, you won't let the world give you their agenda. Listen to the word of God. Let, let's remain kingdom people. Let's be sh good sheep. Let's follow the Lord. Let's not, let's not negate this holy kingdom of God that he has been building inside of us. I mean, the, he is building something inside of our hearts. Not only is he building the church and putting us all together, he's putting us together. 
He's put, he's put us together. It's wild. He loves us so much, He's putting His church together, fitly joined together, perfectly, which every joint supplies. That's got to be special. So special. It's worth living for. It's worth dying for. It's worth fighting for. It's worth loving for. It's worth giving up our life for. I mean, it's worth coming to church. It's worth serving. It's worth doing something kind. It's just worth everything. It's worth leading the next person to Jesus. This is special. We're not of this world. We're born of God. It's different. It's totally different. Totally wonderful. Totally different. In the middle of the noise, we recognize Him. When I was a kid, uh, I got lost a lot, you know, running away. I got lost a lot. When I was a kid, uh, my, my parents, I was an only child. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> but my parents and I did a lot of stuff together. And, and we had, my cousin was with me, or friends were with me, with me, but we did all sorts of stuff. I mean, we, were at, we, we did everything. We traveled, we went to stuff, we just did stuff. Uh, whether it was in the mall or whether it was in a crowd or some park or some amusement thing. Uh, if I ever got lost, uh, we had a whistle. Our whistle was particular for our family. Y'all want to hear the whistle? Anyway, it was a specific whistle. And if, if we heard that, I mean, we, we knew that whistle. It could, be a, it could be a loud place, but that whistle would make it all the way. And, and that's how we found each other. God's calling to us. He's, got a, he's trying to say something. You're supposed to know him. You're supposed to know the voice of the Lord. You're supposed to get familiar with the voice of the Holy Spirit, the unction of the Spirit. When he says, don't say that, be nice. You're supposed to know. When the Holy Spirit says, don't post that, you're supposed to know. Amen. When the Holy Spirit says, consider what you're about to say out into the public. No, I mean, he used to try to help people one-on-one -on -one conversation not say the wrong thing. Now he's got to protect you from saying it to the whole wide world. With all your brilliance, anyway. All your speech seasoned with salt, with grace, always. Anyway, when I got married with my wife, I didn't train her in, the, in that whistle. <laughs> or, or maybe I did. did I? I didn't train her, because I, I, I always know where she's at. She doesn't always know where I'm at. And so she will whistle to me. But hers isn't that loud. Hers is like, It's so light. Yeah, because she can't whistle. It's so light that if you're across the room, you can't hear it. But I, I can hear her across the department store. She can almost be on the other floor and I can hear that. I, I can't see her. She's so far I can't see her, but I can hear that whistle. It's, it's supernatural. She needs me. It can be loud in a place, and I can hear that, I can hear that thing. That is tuned. I, I, got a, I got a frequency, man, that nobody else has. <laughs> we we got to stay away from the world. And, and the sheep, sheep didn't get trained. They just know it. God didn't have to, he doesn't have to train us. We're supposed to know his voice. If you, stay, if you stay silent enough, stay pure enough, stay clean enough, you can just hear it. The problem is when all the world is shouting at you. We've, we've done this before with the youth doing an object lesson. And so we get, we get all the youth, well, we set up a maze of tables and stuff in a room. And uh, the goal is to blindfold somebody and that person has to be navigated through the maze without looking and without bumping into stuff. And so they have one person in the room that's telling them where to go. Turn left, go three steps, turn right, go, go six steps, do this, do that, do this. And, but everybody else in the room is supposed to be shouting really loud, you know, to interrupt them from their journey. And so the goal is to listen to that person who's talking to you. And it's a little bit difficult because it's not supernatural. But the point is you're, you're listening for one voice in your life. You're listening for one main governor. 
One leader. One life leader. That's who you're paying attention to and he'll help you navigate through everything. Isn't that exciting? The problem is when the world is screaming at you. When the world's shoving you. When the world's, you know, think of how much the world can input into our lives. Like I said before, used to, we had to help families uh, uh, minimize how much television the family was watching. Do you see how much harder the message is now? It's not just television, it's 60,000 channels plus the internet. Anyway, we do have to be careful here. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I'll end with this. This is a, a friend, uh, not really a friend, an acquaintance wrote this and it makes sense. He said, a major issue with the advancement of the kingdom of God in the United States is that most believers see themselves in their nationality, denomination, age, and gender before they see themselves as kingdom citizens and ambassadors. Now, I wouldn't say it's true here. I think we've done enough here where most people think of themselves as a Christian first, but it is a challenge and it is necessary. He said, therefore, their kingdom identity and purpose are greatly polluted and diluted, rendering the church powerless to transform the world around us. Most Christians grow personally, but within a Christian bubble that insulates them from true kingdom expansion around them. Within this bubble, and this is why we love to see, I mean, I've known so many people that grew up thinking everybody was Christian. And this is why we love to see young Christians here running around with gospel tracts, handing them out at the restaurants because they recognize everybody needs to be saved, right? Train them up like that early and they'll recognize. And, and so many children that, that have learned this truth, they, they'll almost embarrass their parents when they meet somebody new because they will say, do you have Jesus in your heart? And the parents are like, oh my gosh, don't say that to this person. <laughs> but the kid doesn't care because he's learned the value of a soul. I mean, you have to get educated to forget the value of the soul. De-educated, okay. Within this bubble, they feel comfortable in a casual Christian lifestyle and generally make decisions catering to their comfortability. Comfortability. Thus avoiding their cross at any cost and therefore forfeiting resurrection power that's capable of advancing the kingdom in the world outside their bubble. So, you know, we, we kind of harp on this all the time to make sure we're advancing and, and looking outward. But I think that the U.S. church is comfortable and has to be careful. That we're not aiming to be comfortable. We're aiming to be useful. Deep down, everybody wants to be used, but when it comes down to it, it's like, I don't know if I like that type of work. And we're going to do some gospel work. I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know that, that, that witness and stuff. I don't know if I want to do that. Okay, we're going to have a work day at the church so we can prepare the church property and building for all the people to come. I don't know if I like that type of work either. That's a little bit too much physical labor and it's a little hot out there. And so I, hopefully some of, the, some of the other people will do it. I'm trying to pick on everybody tonight. So if you haven't been picked on, I'm going to try to get to you. There's no sense in the church having to feel like it's pulling teeth when you need some volunteer work done. Why would you even have to ask for volunteers? How come people just aren't around? Just show up to do stuff. Show up to find a guest every Sunday and take them to lunch. I mean, why do you have to tell people, hey, I want y'all to take each other to lunch? I'm really meddling now. I hope the time is almost up because I'm going to get in trouble and I'm going to get stuck and I can't get back out. Come on. This is, we're trying to get in the word engrafted into us where we don't have to be told to volunteer. We don't have to be told to go look for people to bless we don't have to be told to bring a Benjamin to church and give it to some. We don't have to be told this stuff because we're, we're walking with God. We're one with Jesus. We're full of his love and just can't wait to help somebody. Can't wait to love somebody. Can't wait to do something out of the ordinary. Amen. Can't wait to go share Christ. Amen. 